bum 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 bum
is creating all these things and manifesting all these things into a reality. Well, what about other stuff? Like they're pretending to be superheroes, but why aren't superheroes showing up? Where is Superman? Where is Batman? Hold up. Uh, the Bible. Where is God? <laughs> yeah, the logical ex- extrapolation of the um, premise that they've set up is potentially tremendous and devastating. Yes, yes, yes. And so what you're going to hear is us jumping into the deep end of this idea and then, you know, going backwards a little bit into the creation process of the all-nighter. Now, for those of you who perhaps may be rebel tendencies or questioners who defied us and did not pause (laughs) when we specifically told you to, and you're like, I'm just going to listen to this interview anyway, I do want to give you a little bit of a plot synopsis, because I'm an obliger. I can't (laughs) not. (laughs) I'm going to give you a little bit of a plot synopsis just so you can follow the conversation. In the first volume, we're introduced to this little coven, this little family of vampires that is Ian, Cynthia, Joy, and Alex. And they are they are all, you know, past their 40s, into their hundreds, some of them, <laughs> in um, chronological years, but are a variety of ages, like in their like human years, like their the way that they emotional look. years, yeah. Yeah. They've decided that they are getting a little antsy and isolated, just sticking to their own kind. So they want to interact with humanity in a way that humanity won't catch wise that they are, in fact, vampires. So they open a diner that is only at night. Right. And it's going pretty well. But then Alex starts feeling like, well, now I've connected to humanity in this way. I want to take it even further. I want to create some good in the world. So he becomes a superhero. And he's like a fanboy. He loves comic books. And he does have those superhuman vampire powers. So he's super strong. He can jump. Yeah. Tall buildings in a single bound. He's immortal. He's bulletproof. He's got all of the things a good superhero has. He can rip your throat out with his teeth. He just doesn't have an outlet. Yes. Um, So he creates this superhero character called Night Shock, and he starts fighting crime, and uh, Joy, against her better judgment, also jumps in to help as his sidekick t- character. Night Kick. Night Kick. Yeah, she had a hard time coming up on the spot with a, <laughs> with a sidekick name. But then when the other mythological characters began seeing, like, hey, the uh, vampires have found this loophole where they can be out and visible... So how about if they get to be superheroes, we also get to be superheroes or perhaps supervillains. Now, the issue with all of these mythological imaginary characters now revealing themselves as superheroes and supervillains is that there is this group called the Takers that we as readers have not met yet. But they exist to control the population of imaginary beings of imaginary beings. Now, what? Chip and Jason are here to promote today is issue six. Which just came out. And in issue six, we start by exploring the revelation that Ian, the kind of paternal figure in our little vampire family, is actually the manifestation of Bram Stoker's Dracula. And he has been engaged in this power struggle with other factions of who should get to kind of rule over and control these imaginary characters made manifest. Also, Alex and Joy have started really enjoying their superhero personas, despite the fact that they have realized that by creating superhero personas, they have de facto created supervillains. Yes. And supervillains are... uh, uh, wreaking havoc and creating chaos. And then also there is this really interesting Minotaur character who has found himself stuck in the United States and unable to travel because he um, he can't kind of... Because he's a Minotaur. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who's going to let a Minotaur on a plane? Right. Um, you know, unless he's like an emotional support right. Minotaur, I right, guess. Right, right, right. Um, so, so there have been a lot of ramifications from taking this kind of minority and forcing it to exist in secret. Yeah, and looming over everything are the takers who are judge, jury, and executioner over 
these imaginary beings. And we really don't know anything about that. So now you have all the context of the all nighter to go into this conversation with Jason and Chip. The conversation we end up having is a very CBCC conversation about the power of ideas Mm. and that these fictional characters, superheroes, monsters that control our our, our imaginations in turn do control to some degree our lives. And it reminds me a lot of our conversation with Saga and Marco talking to Upshur and Upshur saying like, ideas can create just as much violence as violence. And um, and for some reason, that is just like a concept that gets like stuck in my craw. And you see it interact between Chip and Jason, because Jason initially came up with this idea of saying like, hey, what about vampires running an all night diner? And then Chip goes, oh, that's interesting. But what about if they're the manifestation of the human imagination and then, Oh, that upturns what the comic is. And so we get to talk about like that little bit of creative back and forth that they had that eventually resulted in the all nighter issues one through five. Now, just to like set the table and set expectations. This is a zoom conversation. Yes. Jason in particular was having a little bit of lag issues. And I know that Brad is going to work his editing magic. Fingers crossed. But, you know, anybody who's been on a Zoom call, like it does kind of upset kind of the timing of an in-person conversation. You speak, I speak. Wait, no, I'm speaking. (laughs) And then on top of that, at one point, like a maintenance guy comes in. Yeah, And there's like banging. (laughs) We'll see what I can do with the the editing around it, Lisa. Uh, Also, like Chip's um, connection gets garbled a couple times throughout the conversation, but it's no real inconvenience. And the chat is so entertaining, I don't think you're going to be bothered by it at all. So with our placemat set and our soup spoon on the right side... And all of our hats on our head, hats upon hats... I think we can just dive right into the deep end of the all-nighter conversation with Chip and Jason. Whoa, we are, like, mixing our metaphors. We're, like, setting the table, (sighs) we're wearing hats, we're jumping in a pool... Jason and Chip, welcome to the Love Nest comic book couples counseling style. Hello. We're here to help you guys. Oh, oh, you're counseling us. Well, we have a lot yes. to talk about. <laughs> oh, good, good. Lisa and I were having a conversation just before we jumped on the Zoom room. You know, like when you read this synopsis for the first trade, you're like, okay, vampires, all night diner, masquerading as superheroes. I get that. That makes sense. Uh, but then you really make it complicated by introducing another (laughs) element. Uh, Can you talk about why you decided to bring in the collective imagination of humanity into this plot as well? Um, uh, Because I'm stupid. (laughs) And I wanted to make it uh, harder for myself and for Jason. Uh, It's funny. There's a, there's a phrase that I, um, that I picked up from uh, Matt Fraction which was, uh, <laughs> it was during the period when he was writing a sex criminals pilot and he wanted to make it a musical. Mm. And somebody said to him, you're putting a hat on a hat. Like you've got the premise and it's got a nice hat on it. And now you're trying to put another hat on it. And uh, I have to think of that, especially with regards to this project. Cause I'm just like, oh, you know, superheroes, you know and they're vampires. Oh, we'll put another hat on it. They're in the, the diner. Oh, which is Jason's excellent idea. And I, screwed it all up and then we put another hat on it by making it about the wider kind of kind of meta textual fictional uh universe and then how humankind has kind of uh created that situation for itself so yeah a bit, basically we just like to complicate things jason how did you feel about chip's punch up when he was like yeah your idea but then also this please mute jason's mic <laughs> cut him off cut him off <laughs> i already told him like for our next project after afterlift like let, let's move away from like we don't need to do any superhero genre books let's let's just do something serious something a very like very universal theme message 
that was not to be related. And then when I got like the plot outline of like the five issues, I was like, you mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because originally, because I think it was Jason that was just like, like he wanted to do kind of a small kind of family thing. And and I think Jason's suggestion was the diner. And um, we talked about it being vampires and stuff. I'm like, oh, that would be fun. But like, yeah, I don't, I, I mean, part of it is just, I'm a fan of Jason's uh, previous work, the, the Pitiful Human Lizard. Like he's so good at drawing kind of the quote unquote real life superhero stuff that the idea of like, um these characters kind of doing their kick-ass moment and putting on these outfits uh i couldn't resist having jason draw them and i'm so sorry jason <laughs> well I, I had to like come up with like all these secret identities for mm -hmm. the vampires and all the other monsters and like get into their heads and, and think of like what kind of costumes would they build for themselves and what kind of superhero persona would they create because like all I was kind of left with was like, oh yeah, so like the, these monsters are just going to be the supervillains or the superheroes, and I mean, w w which is kind of cool because like, I, like it, it got me back into wanting to work on superheroes again, and uh, here I am yeah. like doing stuff for Marvel, <laughs> never thinking that I would <laughs> get to that. <laughs> I mean, because wasn't the instruction or not the instruction, but the suggestion that anything but superheroes is what you wanted, Jason? Exactly. But yeah, like I uh, just just wanted to, to, <laughs> to focus on like just just the drama, just just the core of like the, the interactions between the family. But I think, yeah, having the, the, the superheroes and, and, and villains and, and having like the monsters dress up as uh, as uh, these personas really made it much more interesting and, and even spicier. Mm -hmm. So you're not mad at me? No, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no the I zoom admit, delay it, on it that created some suspense. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was perfect. There was a zoom delay there, so it seemed like there was like a two-second pause before you said no. <laughs> Keep that in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> well, Alex has now found himself in a moral quandary not unlike Batman, where he mm. goes like, okay, I'm going to be a superhero so that I can express my true abilities and create some good in the world. But oh no, by doing that, I have manifested supervillains. And the only way to combat supervillains is to keep repeating that first sin of continuing yeah. to be a superhero, um, yep. and, but it is even more layered than Batman because underneath the costume, he is something maybe even more monstrous than just like this egotistical dude. So, <laughs> so, I don't know. Like, I don't know about that, but. <laughs> but talking about like the, the layers of, um, you know, hats upon hats. I, I'm saying yeah. hats upon, I love lots of hats. So I'm saying yeah. that in like a good way. So like, how does like kind of, um, bullet pointing each of these layers of complication. How is that going? Yeah, I mean, the more complicated, the better, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, because there's these there's the added layer to that as well. Like, you know, um, Alex has kind of started this ball rolling and now he's also kind of roping in his friends, his family to also participate in this to stop the uh, the onslaught of supervillains. Um, and also feeling like he, maybe he's inspired something as well, because there's reports of other superheroes out there. Um, but really, ultimately, the true fault lies in uh, whatever uh, uh, sits above them, this kind of mysterious council and the takers and um, these, these rules that have been imposed on them for some reason. So, uh, so yeah, so I, I like that tension between like him having to like, take care of kind of the earthly problems but also be concerned with the kind of supernatural problems that kind of lie in the wings uh yeah i don't know i, I like <laughs> i like complicated stories like it feels like i always want to make sure like on one level it, you can just you can just read it and enjoy it but then uh maybe you're thinking about all the other elements uh as well because those are my favorite kind of stories that you can like hand to somebody who maybe isn't uh, thinking past the, uh, the surface of it but can still enjoy the surface of it which is which is you know uh, a beautiful superhero monster comics drawn by jason and colored by paris but then you have joy within the first like five issues drinking human blood like yeah. so so jason like we have these sweet characters you wanted to create this family dynamic and immediately 
they're murdering people. How does how does that feel? Well, part of, <laughs> how does that I feel? Mean, <laughs> vampires be vampires. That's definitely bound to happen. And he was a bad guy. I'm gonna point that out. Um, it it, oh, it was sure. just the, the whole like yeah 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 it, that 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 needed to happen for sure. Uh, and, and I'm sure like that that was like definitely gonna happen in in the original vision that we that we had planned anyways but yeah i mean like it, it was it was great to uh like to design her costume that way because because uh i kind of uh inspired her costume from like things that she would just take from her closet like her jacket is like something like the product of like 1980s uh <laughs> like it, if she was like a missing child like that's the jacket that she would have been lost in and she just retailored it into a superhero costume i love was- the the back matter of the first trade paperback where we get to see a lot of your designs for these characters and how you really try to um find their character in their costumes a lot of thought went into separating alex's look from joy's look and what what separates them is she has not bought into the superhero Mm -hmm. concept the way that alex has yeah exactly like her like she's not fully in the tights she's like half committed as she is like how she tailored her costume so like half civvies like she can just take off her mask and and she'll just be fine blending in the crowd really right here's the weird thing about the all-nighter is again this collective human imagination creating these things and lisa brought this up this morning if we create vampires from our imagination and then the vampires can turn humans into vampires our imagination is attacking us yeah there's like a parasitic nature there it's not the first time that in literature or in real life uh, humanity has haphazardly created the thing that could ultimately destroy it and probably will. Yeah. It's, yeah. Okay. So, okay. Continue. Continue, Chip. Explain. Oh, so, I mean, I mean, that's kind of like, like a core question here, which is um, if all these supernatural creatures are created by humans and uh, are almost like a, a virus, uh, let's just say like a COVID, are, 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 is the organization above, are they the correct response to keep that in check you know not to get political but are the takers the vaccine that's all i'm saying mm-hmm. and if you're against the takers maybe you're anti-vax i don't know i'm just spitballing here I'm just throwing this out there what did i get myself into <laughs> amazing amazing i mean so now we're going into the next arc issue six has just dropped and the villains want in on this uh fad of superheroes Mm -hmm. and the six issue climax is with the justice angels and what i find fascinating about this book is that hovering over everything are the takers but you're really pleasure delaying us uh with that plot line it feels like you want to keep that in the distance as much as possible you but the main focus is your commentary on superhero fandom yeah i mean uh uh i I like the idea of having a big bad kind of like in the wings the situation with the takers and the storyline of the takers um you'll quickly discover post issue six the connection that the justice angels have to the takers and that whole situation and what's actually um what's actually happening under under the service so yeah, I I I love having a, a big bad kind of delayed and like Jason just kind of drew the takers for us for the first time. And it's awesome. Like mm. it's 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 proper, proper scary, as the Brits would say, proper scary. Chip pretty much had like a one-line description and and I just went with it and just created something like really big that will mm. take on to the next arc. Yeah. Another um, element that's introduced in this issue six is the Minotaur. And the Minotaur has presumably been existing for hundreds of years, but now has been displaced by Lazaruk. And because they cannot conspicuously blend into the population, they have no way to get home. And so Mm -hmm. they're in a museum acting out, creating havoc, but going through some true like emotional distress Mm -hmm. and so there's like kind of this uh, almost like refugee problem created by the human imagination but then we have a ally in officer graves who Mm -hmm. is the first human we know of thus far 
who is part of the system trying to keep everybody's secret. Are we going to continue this conversation of what do we do for these people? Like, are we going to Our continue cast that? Offs. <laughs> are we going to, going to continue that that refugee kind of idea? Um, not as much. Like, uh, Minotaur is a carryover from uh, the first volume. Mm -hmm. Uh, Buttons was the uh, the dastardly uh, bad guy behind them being brought to uh, North America. I wanted the Minotaur's kind of story to kind of um, poke at Joy a little bit and kind of remind her that she's um, she's not home either. Uh, and the fact that he's able to like kind of wear this outfit and go out and do these things, including going to the the the, the museum and 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 trying to find some connection to home through the, you know, the ancient Greece exhibit to remind Joy that there's an avenue there for her that, uh, that even though she cut herself off from home uh, so long ago, that uh, there's a possibility of return for her. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, I, I like the take of it, you know, kind of being a commentary on kind of a, a refugee status, but Minotaur is like a very tertiary character that's kind of like inspiring kind of our main character of Joy throughout this arc, I think. And I, I think what one, one, came up with like the, the idea of like vampires hiding out in, in a late night diner. It, it, it was kind of like, like the immigrant story of like them mm -hmm. trying to get by, like trying to blend in with society, but still like try, yeah, concealing their identity to blend in uh, and, and connecting with other immigrants or other vampires uh, or other monsters um, to cope with each other and, and uh, a, a, as a support system. So, but I, but also I I, I I want to stress, uh, even though Jason is saying that immigrants are monsters, I don't believe that. <laughs> no, no, I don't believe that. <laughs> no. uh, you you both live in an imaginary world. You have created your living coming up and getting to know intimately these imagined characters. Have there been ways that imaginary characters have wreaked havoc on your real lives? Have you seen like? the um an imaginary idea creating real change for you i mean i can i can uh, only speak for myself and say that um uh batman is currently ruining my life <laughs> uh as i have to write 52 pages of script <laughs> this week about him that's 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 my fictional burden um i i wouldn't say change or havoc but <laughs> uh like uh, uh, like uh, I am a believer of ghosts <laughs> and, and experienced uh, a number of unquestionable things. Um, and I mean, like just that idea alone of like they really exist or are they here like just reliving their, their their past lives while we're living our own lives in the present or are they here to try to tell us something or whatever? I mean, that, that kind of freaks me out at times or just <laughs> keeps uh, stays rent free in my mind. Um, but I don't know. I mean, they're not, they're not really imaginary or I don't know. It's, it's, it's still debatable because there are ghosts and <laughs> I have a, I, I have a thing beyond the, uh, my, you know, my, uh, Batman answer, which is that, um, I was reading a book recently and, uh, uh, it's a, it was a novel and it, it called the overstory and it was kind of about the destruction of trees and the environment and uh, um, characters in there trying to stop, you know, logging old forests and things like that. And um, at some point, one of the characters talks about how um, you can have all the facts and figures in the world and you can show them, you can show the world the facts and figures, but it's almost never going to change anyone's mind on a thing. No one's ever gonna go, oh, I didn't realize it was 92%. Okay, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll change this. But when you tell, the, tell a story, uh, that's how you change people's minds. Like it's it's through uh, it's through stories and through fiction that kind of pulls uh, ideas of uh, justice, the world, environment, uh, and, and anything that convinces people more than I think facts and figures. So so fictional worlds that kind of deal with um, larger human issues um, will change people in ways that uh, they don't they don't usually recognize until later on in their lives especially if you're talking at someone who's a bit younger like a fictional character like you know hey like i grew up reading comic books and so like the idea of like justice and the idea of like helping people um uh was there at an early age and you know hopefully that's uh, affected me uh in my in my daily life so yeah i, I think i think i think fictional characters can um 
can change you. Oh yeah, no, I, I have a better answer. Okay. <laughs> I like we're just going to keep doing better answers. I start with well, Batman. Well, well, you went on way. about like, ghosts. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, like, like, you know, like what reading books like the X Men, for example, like a book of uh, misfits or outcasts, and you know, being being like an awkward teenager growing up. Um, like I, I can totally connect with them. Like saying, you know, like reading stories like that, where like you feel you're not alone, and, and see how they handle situations that that you're experiencing. Um, even the, the situations where they don't have to like like resolve it with violence or their superpowers. Like I think those are the ones that feel meaningful and, and resonate with me. Like one of my favorite characters is Multiple Man, and, and growing up as a, an only child, like seeing like how he deals with trying to be happy by himself or like just going through the sadness of himself um like i related to that and and he was my go-to person um of like how to just deal with just being oneself just being on my own and and handling an issue on my own yeah i'm also an only child and threw myself into movies comics novels all that kind of stuff and you know lisa and i talk about this all the time like the, for us answering our own question or i'll answer lisa's question it, it stories allow us to leave our body right we enter into the perspectives of other characters and by living their experience you get a new point of view. Like I take a tremendous amount of comfort from the idea of the multiverse, like <laughs> diverging, di diverging from your life choices yeah. where it can go down to simple as like, I go to a, a restaurant and I, I go like, it doesn't really matter what I order because in the multiverse, I'm ordering everything. It is all mine. <laughs> um, and, and, and like, and I've gotten to the, the point where I'm like, well, to me, it doesn't matter if the multiverse exists or not because it's already made the change in my life. It's already like this comforting idea. So going back <laughs> to the idea of like ghosts and Jason going like ghosts are real, but also we treat them like an imaginary character. Like maybe it doesn't matter. <laughs> maybe it doesn't matter if ghosts are real or not. As long as they're creating that awareness, that, that thought of the past is existing all around us and the past is, is continuing to make change in my life. Yeah, yeah, it makes I'm, sense. I'm, I'm glad you're validating the nonsense I spoke earlier. But well, cause I like reading all nighter, <laughs> I go like, okay, um, we are manifesting vampires. We are manifesting werewolves. Oh, have we not manifested God? Like, and he's, he's creating weather. Like that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the licensing is on God. I'm sure it's complicated. <laughs> I think that's season five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to get to that season. Uh, I, I, I do also want to talk about what it's like to work on a project like this versus other projects, you know, whether it's Batman, Daredevil, uh, Jason, your, your Marvel work that you're doing right now. Like, do you get a relief from working in something like the All Nighter or Afterlift? That you don't get elsewhere. Um, the, uh, for me, there's there's pluses and minuses to both. I mean, the the positive of uh, working on a character like Batman or Daredevil or Spider Man, those kinds, um, is that the world's already there. Like I know the voices. I, I kind of sometimes the writing can just almost feel like automatic because I know I know what Spider Man would do in this situation, right? Um, and also the shortcuts are there emotionally. And I use this example far too often and uh, I feel bad about it. But if I write a Spider-Man story and Aunt May gets hit by a bus, um, people will uh, people will feel something about that. Like, oh my God, Aunt May got hit by a bus. Um, also, the, the bus will end up having its own Netflix series like, <laughs> like or Disney Plus series in 10 years. But if I'm creating a, a creator-owned book with an, with an artist like Jason and we introduce an old lady and she gets hit by a bus, I we got to do a lot of work in order to get people interested in that old lady before she gets hit by the bus. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, like you're starting from scratch, um, not only in creating a world, but creating an emotional connection for the reader with those characters. So you have to really work harder to kind of with the quiet moments and with the character interactions to really kind of build that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, in, in some, in some ways creator owned is harder because of that, but also it's easier because it's like, you can just do whatever you want. Like, I don't have to worry about um, 
uh, the notes from the legal department <laughs> and <laughs> standards and practices, which get more and more um, uh, intense with every passing uh, month. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that makes it much easier. And, and I think it's just fulfilling, like at the end of the day, I mean, like it, it's, it's great to work on our favorite characters for like one of the big two, but me and Chip are like the property managers of our own sandbox with the all-nighter. Mm -hmm. Like we can do whatever we want with these characters and we're creating like our own legacy with these characters. And, and I hope, you know, we, we continue to continue making more stories with them that, that there will be like, <laughs> one of the big three <laughs> yeah. uh like i i think it's just that's that's just a very fulfilling thing to, to have something to call our own at the end of the day yeah and you always have to remind yourself of it too like um look like re recently jason sent us uh several cover options for an upcoming issue and uh, myself and allison our editor kind of weighed on it we really like number two and uh, Jason's response was like, oh, really? Okay, you like number two. Interesting. Okay, all right, I'll get to it. But I immediately wrote back, I'm just like, no, if, if your gut tells you something else, do it. Like, if this was Marvel and like the editor said they like number two, then you just start working on number two. Mm -hmm. But in this case, like, Jason's in charge of the visuals. Like, he owns the visuals. Like, mm -hmm. that's, that's his name's on it. Like, he owns it, the copyright's <laughs> there. Um, if Jason disagrees with uh, a note or something, then then it's kind of a go with God thing. Like, all right, yeah, you're the artist. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, that's, uh, that's a big more, difference. No, mine, mine was like more reply. Like Chip was saying, like uh, I like number two, I think, and I was like, wait, you think? Like, you're not sure. <laughs> that was that was my reply. <laughs> that, 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 that's also we're all uh, Canadians. We're also like, maybe are you okay? Are you good with this? Is that all right? Like. <laughs> Sometimes like, it's hard to break out of that. Be, be, be definite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I read in a previous interview, uh, Chip, you refer to it like a creative partnership as being kind of like a marriage, like where at first you're dating and you're trying not to like step on any toes and mm -hmm. you're on your best behavior, but then eventually the filters the filter. come off and yeah. and you're just you're just living your life creating something together. Interrupting each other. <laughs> and <laughs> like I do. <laughs> I do uh, identify closely with the with Jason going like like I'm only accepting super enthusiastic um, confirmation of my choices <laughs> today. Like Brad and I <laughs> have that a lot where we I go like ah what did you think of that that interview today and he goes like oh it was good and I was like okay well now my day is ruined and the entire temperature of this room has changed. <laughs> like it's so it's so funny having worked with like dozens of editors at this point. Um, there's a real range in terms of like feedback. Uh, but the, I think the key is consistency. Like I have some editors, I have one editor at DC who's super excited no matter what. Mm. Like any page that gets drawn, any script that comes in, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. This is awesome, this is great. And like that feels really good for a while. But then you're just like, oh, you just you just do this all the time. <laughs> Whereas at Marvel, uh, my favorite editor there, sorry, all other editors, is Tom Brevoort. And I forget, Jason, have you worked with Tom? Are you on FF yes. stuff? Or? Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And he's, he's, uh, he's the best editor, he, the best story sense. And I've talked to other writers where we'll send in a script. And um, if they don't hear back from him, uh, except to say, like, got it, thanks, um, then it's good. And he's passed it on to the artist. If he goes, got it, reads well it's great. Like you've done it. Uh, I've, I've only heard of like one writer actually getting a response where it's just like, this is a great script. Wow. And it was like, I think they printed it out and framed it. Um, so it's, it's all, it's all about your expectations when it comes to that kind of feedback. I wonder if like Tom Reaver comes from like that generation of, of like um, editors from back in the day where like like I, I remember getting this this one feedback from Larry Hammond when I used to uh, do apprenticeship with them and you know like he, he gave me like some of the very harshest critiques where like I almost wanted mm -hmm. to quit comics yeah. but then like after a while like I showed him this one like Canadian GI Joe comic and I was like hey Larry what what do you think and he was like well there's a story and I was like <laughs> that's good that's good I didn't get hey. that before. <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh you know slowly but surely you know 
getting the little 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 bits of uh, approval. Um, and I, I I I I I like it that way. I really do. Like like uh, the the best thing about Tom. Sorry, we're just talking about. Uh, oh, we love Tom. Account. Tom's been on the podcast. Where he's he's, he's amazing. He's got like a huge institutional knowledge. Um, but also he's he's the most responsive editor too. Like like you'll always get a response from Tom, the feedback you need. Um, uh, and, uh, and I appreciate him more every day. The more editors I work with, the more I'm just like, oh, Tom. Hmm, a nice, you know, stare at the clouds, thinking about Tom with his hat and his beard. Yeah, like when I first started writing and I got my first editor, it was like the worst year of my life because I mm. felt like every comment was like soul crushing. Yeah. And it wasn't until you start working with other editors that you really go like, oh, that guy I hated, he was actually probably a pretty okay guy. <laughs> Yeah, like I came, I came from, I came from newspapers, and uh, the deadlines were just so crazy because it's daily. Mm-hmm. Um, that the editor's notes were just like, cut this, move this, change this, do this. This doesn't work. Get rid of it. Like, they were very abrupt. So, like, going into comics, where people were like, oh, "This is great. I just suggest you maybe do this thing." It's just like, what? Like, <laughs> I'm not a child. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I, I, I think like an interesting place to wrap up this conversation is with where you guys get your affirmation you know you've been working in this field for a long time now uh you have fan bases that i would say are rabid and we we belong to them (laughs) Uh, and so you must be buffeted by affirmation on a fairly frequent basis how do you one deal with that and does that fuel your love tank in a way that it always has has that evolved jason um yeah, for, for, for me, I mean, de- definitely not for like the Goodreads comments, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> uh, it, it can be a mixed bag. Um, I mean, I mean, it, it's definitely great to 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 get some of the the positive feedback on, on Twitter, or even like talking. Like, I, like I I, I did an, a few podcasts last week relating to like my X Men work, but like, oh, like yeah, just recently, like I, I did this X Men run featuring Multiple Man, like a very dealist character that if you if you know him you know him if you know him you love him um and you know like i i know this is something that not a lot of people would fan over but it's like oh like i, I got to accept that like i'm doing this for myself it makes me happy um and, and that's what it's all about really and i get away with it too so <laughs> yeah it's easier it's easier with the the c list and d list characters like when i was doing howard the duck i'm just like i'm just knocking out of the park every issue everyone loves it well yeah because like there's no fandom for the character and if there is it's very tiny and so it's like uh they're just excited that there's something happening and that you're doing a relatively good job on it but as you kind of move up to the, the, the bigger characters like if you're doing spider-man or batman like you're screwed like um everyone's got their own ideas of those characters and so you'll just get like comments that are just complete opposite you'll be someone like this is the best spider-man thing i've ever read this is the worst spider-man thing i've ever read and it's like well once i kind of hit that point i was just like oh i can't listen to any of this like if you believe one then you have to believe the other right like you, you can't just you can't just pick and choose and be like oh i only believe the good comments and like there's no <laughs> i hate to say it but there's no like IQ barrier of entry to comment on a thing. Like no one's got to fill out a skill testing question to leave a comment. So like you'll get a lot of stupid people <laughs> who just don't know how to read stories giving you comments. Um, and it's like, oh, I, I just had to turn it off at some point. Like uh, lately, especially, I'm just like maybe going into Batman. I kind of recognize this more is that I just doing it for myself. I got, if I'm not just doing it for myself, and just kind of like focusing on that, um, then uh, then I'll get, I'll get lost in it. I think every creator has their own like thing where, you know, Dan Slot like loses his mind every once in a while, just like reading Spider-Man comments, right? You know, Scott Snyder, you know, interacts with the fans who tell him that he's written the worst Batman. Just like like everyone's got their own kind of ways to deal with the fandom. And uh, at this point, I'm very happy to kind of remove myself from it, uh, live in the woods write the comics I want to write and I don't I don't need the affirmation anymore uh, because I also I recognize affirmation for um, company owned characters is false mm. it's false because it's just like it's someone saying oh yeah you did it the way I want it to be done and that's that's not actually a proper critique of the work 
doing something right. like sex criminals though is very different because when, when we were doing that it was like people don't know those characters they pick it up you know they get into it they love it you meet them it's all wonderful and and just and joyous and very pure about the, the book you're writing um but for the company characters it's like, like there's so much baggage that a reader brings along with it that uh that it can become quite toxic really quickly so how do you keep your enthusiasm for okay i will do batman yeah i'll take the most popular character on the planet i mean it's cool as hell like that's the thing like i grew up reading it i watched all the movies and the tv shows and i'm like oh yeah this would be fun like and i have to really focus on the fact that like making it's fun getting the art is fun seeing the final product is fun putting it out into the world is fun i don't need the feedback on it really mm -hmm. um I, there's no way to avoid, avoid it i mean i don't look at twitter anymore really I don't post on Instagram. Like my sub stack is very much, that's the barrier to entry because if you want to comment, you got to pay $7 a month to yell at me, <laughs> which is frankly, I think every You have to be that devoted to comment, really. I know, I know. If you're paying seven bucks and you want to tell me I suck, great. That's fine. <laughs> For the price of two coffees a day, you can yell at me all month. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I'm enthusiastic about it because I enjoy telling stories. I mean, that, that's, 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 that's what it almost all comes down to. Well, Jason Chip, this has been a real pleasure talking the all nighter with you two. Uh, we're very excited about the comic. I feel like you guys have built a, a pretty large mythology that could go on forever if you were willing and if the readers were willing. Uh, so do, is there a third volume on the horizon possibly after this one? Uh, we, we have plans for the third volume. Um, but uh, we have to kind of talk to Comixology to see if they want that third volume. Oh, yeah. There's the there's the added kind of wrinkle that um, Amazon Studios right. is in the process of making a, a streaming show about the about the property. Um, I mean, if that got picked up, then yeah, they'd want season three, four, five, six. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we'll see. We'll see. Like, I think I think definitely don't want to overstay our welcome. Like, that's one of the beauties of creator own too. Is like. Um, uh what we have in mind for like the third series feels like an, an ending so but it was the same with uh afterlift our previous one like we, we did it very consciously to be its own story five issues and it's done like mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. we didn't really leave it open for a sequel some people think we do but i think that's because people have kind of sequelitis in their brains <laughs> and they can't recognize that a story is over and i get that um but yeah that's the nice thing about creator own like not to take up too much of your time, but again, my hero, my friend, Matt Fraction, told me that um, writing uh, company comics is like writing a constant second act. Mm. You don't actually get to resolve anything. You think you do. You give the illusion of resolving a thing, but someone's writing this, the issue after you. Um, but with a creator on, you can actually have like a proper three act, wrap it up, have it feel satisfying, and that's the end. So, uh, so I. With, with something like the all nighter, I don't want it to like go on to the point where people are like, oh, you're still doing that, eh? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe by the time we introduce God, uh, we jump the shark. Oh, like, well, cause like, that's the thing to me is like, once we get to these takers, where do we go beyond the takers? But mm -hmm. I want to, I want to go beyond the takers. Yeah. That's where I really want to head. Yeah, 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 I, I, I totally get that. And uh, uh, we'll see if we get that series three. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Woo. All <laughs> right, fingers crossed. Hey, Amazon, pick this one up. Make it happen. I want to see Amazon. Show. Use some of your money for good. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Chip and Jason, uh, Chip, you've already mentioned some of your socials already, but for our listeners, we're going to have links in all the show notes to your Substack and whatnot. But in case people don't uh read my show notes can you tell the folks where they can find you online to continue this conversation uh yeah uh, you can find me at jason low loo makes comics on instagram and tiktok uh tiktok it's, oh, it's crazy i uh i i found this untapped market of, of a comics community and they're very friendly and supportive very positive compared to twitter i highly recommend all comic creators to jump on that because wow it's yeah, it, it's the best. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at rebel underscore L-O-O. Man, maybe I should do some TikTok. Comic talk is a big thing on TikTok, and I've never felt older being on it. 
but uh, we're we're <laughs> we're trying. Oh my god, yeah, I'm just I yeah, I might be too old for it. The uh, a friend, friend of mine, of his daughter, um, started doing like kind of animations on TikTok. Like she's a teenager, and she's got like far more followers than any of us do on anything. It's like wow, thirty k followers, yeah. Oh, she's in like the sixty k. It's just nuts. Um, uh, I'll say the, the only place that I recommend you find me is, is zdarsky.substack.com because uh, I'm not posting on Twitter and I rarely post on Instagram and I've deleted my Facebook. So it's like, I'm in the wilds. I'm in the wilds. Get your money worth of <laughs> bad comments and send them to his Substack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take well, subscribers any way I can get them. <laughs> <laughs> well uh thank you gentlemen uh again we really enjoyed the all-nighter we want more all-nighter we want you to jump the shark we want you to keep going beyond when it should stop that's that's well, how much we want it now that you mentioned jump the shark maybe this shark is a character now maybe we introduce the like the happy days episode actually generated this actual shark and these characters will actually have to jump this shark at some point i love I mean, it i love it when's batman Hello. making an appearance in the all-nighter yeah, when are the superheroes showing up that's what I i'm know. wondering yeah, yeah. I know I've got some pull at DC now. I'll try and make it happen. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, again, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having us. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Wasn't that nice? It was so fun. Though so now at this point, I'm wondering, like, do we need to add to the CBCC drinking game? Like Lisa's talking about the multiverse again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I, I I really enjoyed you bringing it up. And I loved watching Chip's reaction to you bringing up the multiverse and how it is a comforting uh, notion to you. Like, hey, I've eaten all the food, so it doesn't matter what I order. He got a real good <laughs> giggle out of that. Oh, I'm 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 so glad. Like. After we did that interview, we actually went for a walk and we continued talking about the comic. And like we talked about, like, if um, if these if these entities, if these we're creating people that um, through our imagination, like by imagining vampires, we bring them into existence. We started talking about like, well, where are superheroes? Yeah. Like, where are they? And part of me is wondering, like. It could be like a lot of the things that have been manifested are things that we are frightened of, like bridge trolls and vampires. They're all, yeah, nefarious entities. But like part of me wonders if like the reason that superheroes haven't manifested is because we don't actually believe in mm. like that level of altruism mm. that someone really would, you know, sacrifice themselves it's or... a fantasy too far yeah whereas uh a, you know a, a, a vampire makes some kind of logical sense you know okay i've turned my back on god uh god's gonna damn me to internal damnation as a bloodsucker yeah that works superman <laughs> i don't know like an another part of me wonders like well, um, we've imagined vampires in particular, just as an example, so many different ways. Yeah. And so I go like, well, is Ian Dracula a soulless vampire? Yeah. Well, um, like may perhaps Joy comes from was sired by a vampire who who was created out outside the idea of a soul. And are we going to get also, wh where are the vampires that were manifested by Twilight? Like, where are yep. the sparkly, sexy yep. vampires? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 like, what I like so much about this comic is adding that the, the taker's element. You know, just when you think you've read every version of vampire fiction, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's such... Um, like talk about a virus, like vampire fiction, that's a virus. Like it spreads, it has spread into everything. And there's subgenres within subgenres. And you think you've seen it all. And along come Chip Zdarsky and Jason Lowe with this interpretation and making us the villains yet again, but villains in a way that we've never been villainized before. Like to me, like, like what is the logical extrapolation of that? Like when we find out, Oh, we are creating an oppressed race of imaginary creatures. Yes. Do we have to stop making literature? Is yeah. literature just, are ideas just too dangerous? Yep. What happens 
when humanity becomes aware of what their imagination is doing. Is that what the takers are actually protecting? Are they just librarians? Are they just like super pro literature? Yeah. And we're like, we have to let people keep creating because we need shit to read. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very curious to see where this next arc is going. You know, issue six ends with this other faction of vampires masquerading as the Justice Angels, mm-hmm. uh, wanting in on the superhero game. Uh, but but as, as they teased in this conversation, Jason and Chip are bringing in the Takers. It seems like we're going to see the Takers in the next few issues, and I'm really excited about that. But what's that third volume? Mm-hmm. I need that third volume. I need that fourth volume. Uh, to me, like, The All-Nighters is such, like... And like conversation stimulant where you're just like you like once you get into the the idea of like, oh, we are creating we are creating evil and good and whatever with our ideas. And it's influencing us in a very like literal way. Like it's just it really gets you thinking. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun. It, it, It was fun to like have this conversation with Chip and Jason. And then, you know, they leave the Zoom room and Lisa and Brad are like, well, we're not done talking about the all nighter. We need to go on a walk. Let's continue this chat. And that chat, I wish we'd been recording that, too, because that was a lot of fun as it well. It should all be content, our entire marriage. Uh, yes, agreed, agreed. Uh, so that is going to do it for this week's episode. We're recording this the eve of myself uh, leaving for California. I'm attending Star Wars Celebration, covering it for Film School Rejects. So hopefully you've been checking out our uh, Twitter and Instagram feed, and hopefully I've been having a lot of fun there, Mm -hmm. meeting and talking to rad people, and you have all seen those photos. And hopefully Lisa had a good time by herself. Yeah, yeah. I was really trying to not guilt trip Brad out of having a good time by saying like, well, while you're there, like, yeah, we're going to be separated, but you get to be distracted by this really fun new convention experience. And I'm just going to be at home staring at the walls of the love nest. Yeah, but the love nest walls are, you know, postered in all kinds of rad Covered things. in physical media. Action figures, comics, Blu-rays, I will be DVDs. definitely <laughs> spooning some comic books while you're gone. Yeah, yeah. And our plan is to record at least a Patreon episode, hopefully on one of those days I'm out in California using Zencaster. So, uh, if yeah, it's a good reason why you guys should join Patreon to see how our marriage is going while we're separated. <laughs> I, there, He gets no hall passes. Uh, so, no. no Princess Leia's on this trip. What about Oscar Isaac? Though. Oh yeah, well you Ewan know, McGregor's going to be there, Lisa. <laughs> like, like uh, Ewan McGregor is a share toy. You don't get <laughs> Ewan McGregor all by yourself. Uh, and so you're going to be wanting to join our Patreon to hear that special episode. If you're not tired of vampire talk. We also chatted with writer, artist Christian Ward about his new image comic series, Bloodstained Teeth, which uses the vampire metaphor to talk about capitalism mm-hmm. and class. And uh, and he says that it's not about uh, losing your soul, but I think it is. <laughs> but Lisa <laughs> thinks it is. Lisa thinks it is. And, and that was a really fun conversation, which you can find uh, like an article on the website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or you can listen to the entire chat over on our Patreon feed. Links in the show notes. Uh, But then, next week, we return to a new couples session. Yay! Angela and Sarah, uh, the Marvel Comics couple from Angela Asgard's Assassin. We're going to do three episodes on them. And boy, am I excited to dive into that chat. It'll be a first time read for me, a second time read for Lisa. It's a couple that our listeners have been clamoring for, for several years. Jamie and Max. Actual years. People have been wanting us to cover Angela and Sarah, and we're finally giving it to them. So yeah. yay. And it's Pride Month, and we're going to plan, we're going to pretend that that was the plan all along. <laughs> uh, but no. It, it was certainly the universe's plan. It was the universe's plan. Happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go, my friends. That is going to do it for us. Yeah, I really got to go. I'm covering a shift for Alex while he's out being <laughs> Night Shock because somebody's got to run the diner.
while all of this is happening. So, Brad, mm. where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? You can find me on all social medias at MouthDork. If you have words of affirmation for our logo, you can send them to Aaron Prescott at A Cool Hand Fluke. And if you have some words of affirmation for our radical banner art and show poster, send them to Karen Charm at Karen underscore X-Men fan. Lisa, where can our listeners send their words of affirmation to you? I am always accepting words of affirmation at Sidewalk Siren on Instagram and Twitter. If you'd like to spend more quality time with us, you can subscribe to us on Podbean, Stitcher, YouTube, Google, and Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to get exclusive, you can join our Patreon, where you'll get more content, including weekly bonus episodes. If you'd like to reach out and touch us electronically, you can email the podcast, cbccpodcast at gmail.com. You can visit our website, comicbookcouplescounseling.com, or follow us on Instagram and Twitter at cbccpodcast. You can give us the gift of five stars on Apple Podcasts. And if you'd like to do an act of service, why not write a review of the show while you're there? Yeah. We are fluent and receptive in all five love languages. It really warms our hearts and helps the pod. So until next time, friends, keep your love tank full. And your psychic rapport open. Doopy doopy. <laughs>